Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us on this unbelievably sunny day. I'm very impressed that we could draw you in from the bright sun. Uh, my name is Ed Behrens. I'm the editor of Apollo magazine. And I am joined today by three wonderful curators who all uh, explore design in slightly different ways. And that is what we're going to be discussing today. So first, I'm joined by Andrea Lipp, who is the head of digital and associate curator of contemporary design at the Cooper Hewitt. Wolf Burchard, who is associate curator of European sculpture and decorative arts at the Met and was responsible for the Disney exhibition that was recently there. And Matthew Jakobsky, who is the senior curator of fashion and material culture at Brooklyn Museum. Uh, and Matthew actually worked on the David Bowie exhibition. David Bowie is dot, dot, dot. Um, and I thought that might be quite a nice place for us to start because I always wondered how, when you're faced with the career of a rock god, do you put that in a museum context? How do you display that? Um, it, well, it's challenging. Because, uh, uh, you know, typically when you're making a museum exhibition, you have uh, particular objects that you're going to tell your narrative or your story with for the exhibition. And with somebody that's a rock star, uh, you have to think about what kind of elements are available or exist, you know, because their careers are not about making objects. Their careers are largely about making music or performance or dance or acting. And in the case of Bowie, he did all of those things. So when we went into his archive, and his archive was quite, ex he first of all, you know, today we would say he was a hoarder or something, but you know, but he really did keep his whole uh, history. So when you look at it though, and look at the things that are his history, it's, uh, you know, the things we know first are his costumes, uh, but then there's also, very interesting things like his handwritten song lyrics, his um, uh, own paintings that he did, uh, all of the music videos that he collaborated on. And typically, if you were making an exhibition of objects that were from a an art collection, you'd be looking at them and asking yourself questions, well, what is the best example of that? Or how could, which piece should we choose to tell this story the best way? And if you're uh, looking at an archive made up of so many disparate things, you're trying to think about how you're going to tell the story, but also uh, make sure that each thing feels important to the story, that, it's, that it, everything you're having in the show is additive. And so with the case with David Bowie is, it actually had begun in London at the Victoria and Albert Museum which of course is where David Bowie was born. And because, I think because it was, had started in London, it was, it was curated from that perspective. But of course, David Bowie had lived in New York City for t over 20 years. He had had a long career here. And so I felt part of my responsibility was being sure that New York was also an equal part of the narrative. So. We took the Victoria and Albert show, we uncoupled it, added New York in, and then remade it. So a lot of people felt that the Brooklyn Museum presentation of David Bowie is, um, was uh, a very different show than they had seen in London. Yes. So I'd go on. <laughs> and this is sort of for all of you really, but how do you begin when you've got things that are not designed to be hung on a wall. Obviously, museums are primarily designed to have things put on walls or to have things put in pedestals. So especially with someone like Bowie, there's an enormous amount of material that doesn't work on a wall. How do you begin to set it up so that an audience can understand a story that you're telling and read their way through it. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things I want to comment on with the David Bowie is exhibition that I thought was, was also incredibly effective was it brought in not just the objects, but also it made it much more experiential because of the integration of music and the immersion of, um, of those elements to it. And so this is the one thing that I think particularly with 
you know, objects of design or particularly like archival type works that are not necessarily, you know, um, singular objects and are there because of, you know, their, their grandeur and importance to that story, but, you know, contribute to something additively. There's something about, about then, you know, being able to provide and, and display all of that in a broader context and in a broader experience. And I think that that was one of the things that was really effective about that exhibition, um, was it wasn't just looking at objects on a pedestal or on a plinth, um, you know, but helped them become enlivened by everything else that was going on around you. Which, is, which I think brings us to immersive experience. Well, yeah, let's go there. I thought we were going to do that later. But so, am I right in thinking from previous conversations that we've had, you're not a wild fan of pedestals? <laughs> a pedestal serves a purpose. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And I mean, I, I, I suppose in in curating collections or you know or, or temporary like special loan exhibitions or whatnot, it really depends upon the story that you are seeking to tell with an object. And absolutely, I think, you know, pedestals and, and plinths and vitrines and whatnot, you know, they have their place if you are seeking to, you know, to showcase that object and you want all of the attention on that object. However, I feel like sometimes there's a broader context that you can bring in through perhaps more immersive types of experiences, bringing in other elements beyond just looking at something, beyond it just being a visual experience, bringing in, let's say, sound yeah. <laughs> into something, um, you know, tactility. Museums hate people touching things, but <laughs> it's really interesting if yeah. there's a way that you can pull that off. Yeah. Um, you know, but I, I think that there are other kind of sensorial mechanisms that we can use to, you know, to enliven objects. So pedestals and, and plants, fine, again, and depending on the context. But and I guess I'm curious you, can, to, you yeah. can play around with pedestals. I mean, a pedestal doesn't need to have a particular standard height. Yeah. I mean, I think, for instance, of uh, a set of objects that we had in the Disney exhibition, which were these mad, tall, Sevres Tower vases, um, which when I saw them for the first time, I thought, you know, the contemporary association would be they look like a Disney castle. It's a, sort of mm. a, Sev it's a tower of porcelain, but pink. And there were two sets, one which we had at the Met and one at the Huntington Museum. And I was determined that we would actually show them not in a traditional way as a garniture, but like a castle. So we had four pedestals. It would have been a nightmare for you. We had four <laughs> pedestals made of different heights so that they would evoke different turrets of a castle at sort of different heights. And then the whole thing was in a large glass box. And to my amazement, children absolutely loved it because it looked like a, like a Disney castle. So there were lots of you know, noses pressed against the glass. But I, I suppose that you know, pedestal, I mean, I see what you mean as a pedestal, as a sort of symbol of sort of standard uh, museum display. But I think that within that, you can play around quite a lot, yeah. um, which is fun. Yeah. And I guess it's that playing around that is the way of telling stories. One of the, that's sort of what the thing I most want to get to, is how do you use design to tell a story, and how do you tell design to tell different stories? So I'm, I'm just going to throw it open to all of you to pick up as you like. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting question, and, I, and actually I'm thinking specifically of something that's at the Met, um, currently the, that Afrofuturist, um, Period room, yeah. Yeah, the period room, which is absolutely fascinating because it's such a, again, using very different display mechanisms. Um, but I just think the way in which it contextualizes all the objects contained within that space mm -hmm. is really quite unique to tell a very holistic story within it. And it works because it's on a sort of relatively small scale. I mean, I yeah. think the, the great thing is when you, when you work for a large museum that has quite regular exhibitions, you are, you know, the parameters within which you work vary, whether you do an exhibition that's going to be up for three months, or you look after a gallery that's supposed to be there for the next 30 years. So before I did the Disney exhibition, I inherited a large um, gallery project, the British Galleries at the Met, where uh, the Metropolitan Museum had worked very closely together with a design firm that hadn't ever worked on, on museum galleries before. And they try to create, I mean, they'd done film sets and, and, and TV sets, et cetera, and, they, and, and hotels and restaurants. And the, and the reason why they were chosen was because they created beautifully, beautiful spaces, beautifully lit spaces in which people like to 
spend time. And that's exactly what we want to do. We want people to spend time in, in those spaces. So um, they created a backdrop for our object so that they could sing. Um, but that was sort of visually appropriate for, you know, thinking about the right colors, you know, sort of rather dark colors in front of which, you know, for instance, Victorian ceramics would really pop. Um, but I think that the key thing is when it comes to design, and that was also true in, in designing the, the Disney exhibition, is that while you want to create something appropriate and maybe something, depending on the subject, whimsical or sort of sober, uh, it's important that you, the, the design remains in the background. And I, I think we see very often, or often enough anyway, um, design firms that come in and are asked to do a, uh, a, 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 either a, a an exhibition or a, a, a gallery, and then really want to leave their mark. And that's a big problem because then, you know, they, I mean, I can think of one permanent gallery in a very important museum which, uh, in which you now can't see the objects because all the labels are in front of it and there's far too much going on and the design is just over-designed. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, that, and, and the same, of course, is true of exhibition catalogues. Um, I mean, for instance, for the Disney exhibition catalogues, the, the, uh, the temptation is always, oh yeah, let's have a really quirky design and a lot of different fonts. And actually, you don't want that. And I said to the designers, no, 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 we want a really clean design because every single image is quirky enough and the image should speak for itself. We don't need all kinds of, you know, ornamentation around it. But if you if you have a room that is designed to show off the object, mm -hmm. there's still obviously the curated element of it where you then need to frame the story around it with, as you said, the storytelling, the labels. So how, what is the, what's the interconnectedness between the design and those stories? Is there one or do you, have a fairly simple design and then change the storytelling through other means. Does that make sense as a question? It does, and I'm, I'm happy to take it. Um, I had, I had uh, curated an exhibition uh, called The Senses, Design Beyond Vision. Uh, and for that particular exhibition, um, we really test the exhibition designers themselves with with coming up with an exhibition design that heightened the sensorial experience. So rather than receding, per se, in favor of the object, something that enhanced your experience overall um, of all of it. And, and I think that that was very specific because of the nature of what that exhibition was. Yeah. Um, and so this is the thing. Is I, I think it's always about the intention <laughs> Of, of the curatorial intention of what it is you're doing. Um, certainly there are times when exhibition designers come in and are a bit too heavy handed um, and you end up focusing so much more on what the design itself is than what the objects are and what the story is. Um, but uh, uh, the other thing too, actually, I was I was thinking about was there was an exhibition that was here um, in the Park Avenue Armory. I don't know if anyone saw it. It was the Red and White Quilt Exhibition, and this was maybe like 12 years ago or so. It was absolutely spectacular. You recall this? Yes, it was beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And it was red and white quilts, yes. which you would think, you know. You say that like they're not excited. <laughs> I don't know what's happening here. But it was the way in which they were yes. displayed and really taking advantage of the height. Right. Of the room. That, and I think that that's really important to bring up. Um, if you are familiar with my career, I've spent half my career doing exhibition design and half doing curation. And, the, the challenge always with exhibition design is what is the space you're starting with? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, if a lot of times today you're given a white box and you have, or you're working from a blank slate, but if you're working at the uh, Cooper Hewitt, you're working in a mansion, uh, which is a very different type of space to be working in. And it gives you so much character already, uh, so, so many, uh, so much personality um, in good ways in a, a lot of times. Uh, uh, but you're, you're then having to uh, have a conversation with the environment from the get-go. Mm -hmm. So are you going to erase it uh, or are you going to uh, uh, work with it? Uh, so, um, you know, when I went to see the Disney exhibition, what was great is it was, uh, you know, they were traditional 
museum galleries, but then he added these beautiful doorways to it. That, and doorways are a great uh, location and exhibition to do something that adds flair to your show, but doesn't necessarily uh, create a background for your artwork. So a lot of times you do work in exhibitions where you're trying to find that neutral zone that you can't have art in, but then can provide a lot of ambiance and uh, 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 mood uh, to, your, to your exhibition. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I'm sort of intrigued by this ambiance, which again takes us back to immersiveness, mm -hmm. I guess. I feel this is the thing we're skirting around. Um, because it also comes back to how easily a, a visitor reads what they reads the story they're being told mm -hmm. from what's going on around them. So with Disney, obviously, you set the tone from the doors. I have to confess, I saw the Disney show in London, so I had different doorways from <laughs> the ones here, and to all accounts, they were horribly less impressive. Anyhow, um, <laughs> but but it's but it, is that, and we spoke about room set. I mean. And then there are rooms like the rooms in the Met that already exist. So do we consider a room set an immersive experience? Where do we draw the line around immersiveness? And how important is a room set? How much more can we do? But, and then how far do you have to go down it where you just have people going to big empty rooms with projections of lights that are so-called immersive experiences? Don't get me started on those. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should start. <laughs> yeah. No, the ch uh, just to get rolling, you know, I mean, part of the challenge with that, you know, when you're working in a museum is that you go to these immersive experiences which are licensing your artwork in order to create some type of an animation in which there is no art, yeah. you know? You're paying $45 to see a projection so that, you're, that you can walk into the artwork. Uh, and then you could come see the actual art for, for $25, $30. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, a, it's, it's challenging for us, yes. you know? And then people say, oh, well, you know, an exhibition like Bowie mm -hmm. was immersive from the get-go because mm -hmm. we was always going to have immersive sounds. So when you came to the David Bowie exhibition, you bought your ticket, but then you got a pair of headphones. And the headphones were really cool. We collaborated with Sennheiser because as you walked through the exhibition, each room you went into, the sound changed on its own. You didn't have to click anything. And so you were like walking through a movie uh, of a sort. Um, so, but today we're talking about a lot about visual yes. environment of objects, but certainly the audioscape that you're walking within can completely transport you. Uh, we just did uh, an exhibition about Terry Mugler at the exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum. And the first gallery you went into was um, a 3D hologram of a dress that he had designed for a production of Macbeth, which had a 3D soundtrack to it. Um, and people walked into that show and really just felt like they were taken out of their everyday and they were immersed in a new world, mm -hmm. uh, the world of Terry Mugler. And that's a, something that you have to think about when, you know, how, how, how transportive is your experience going to be, you know, and how, how much can you do it without it feeling like a hat trick, you know? Right. And I think underlying all of that is ultimately then what a museum is <laughs> mm -hmm. versus, you know, what is just, you know, any of these experiences, let's, you know, let's say like the Van Gogh experience or some such, mm -hmm. which in some ways is pure entertainment. Whereas, you know, I really look at, at museums themselves. We are institutions of memory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we are there. I, I hope people are able to come to museums and see collections and see exhibitions and leave having gained something, you mm -hmm. know, whether it's, you know, you, you learned about a certain object or a certain material or a certain way of, um, of making something or, you know, just had a, a slight perspective shift within it. So, um, 
you know, so I, I think that using some of those, those, those little tricks and whatnot mm. um, in some way are to, to help to get you there to deepen what that experience might be. Um, but that ultimately it, 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 serves, it serves a purpose that is very unique from any of those just like pure projections on a white wall. Mm -hmm. um, I thought an interesting hybrid model of it yeah. was that um, during COVID, the Museum of Natural History had done an exhibition about color. And they had rooms where it was about, you know, they had a sea of red dresses, mm -hmm. for example, but then they had other spaces that you walked into which had the projection elements. And somehow they, it was a nice conversation between the technology and the works that are in that collection. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So there are two things to pick up on, I think, here. One is about digital, which I think we might pick up a little later. But before we get there, uh, there's a way in which what you're saying is that design is being used to smuggle in the education stuff. Mm -hmm. um, how, how true is that? I mean, Wolf, how true was that with Disney? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, when we're talking about an immersive experience, I mean, you know, how immersive an experience, I mean, walking into the European paintings gallery as the Met, in theory, is an immersive experience because you're surrounded by amazing art. The, the question is, um, is this enough to grab your attention? Mm -hmm. and, um, and really, depending on the subject matter and who your audience is, you need different tools to, to grab people's attention. I mean, the, obviously, the United States has this great tradition of period rooms, which were created in museums here to allow people who didn't have the opportunity to travel to Europe to immerse themselves in European architecture. Um, and now, of course, you know, people are, are, are redefining what a period room is and what we can do and how we should present the collection. I mean, for instance, in, in, in the British galleries at the Met, um, they are relatively sparsely furnished these days in order for people to be able to enter those rooms. Because for instance, we have the Lansdowne dining room, which uh, had a beautifully laid out dining table, but you couldn't enter the room. So people couldn't actually immerse themselves in the Adam architecture. So in the, in the problem here is that always, you know, you can either do one or, or, or the other. Um, with Disney, I mean, I, um, I said to our designer who, who designed these wonderful um, arches, uh, Patrick Heron, that we should uh, really try and find the sweet spot between academic sobriety and juvenile playfulness because I wanted people to be able to experience this exhibition on different levels so that those who wanted to really engage with the material and the, and the intellectual discourse associated with it really saw that this was a serious show. But equally, we wanted people to be able to go through it and just enjoy themselves and see that this is fun because ultimately those works were created to be fun and that's true both of the Disney material and the, uh, and the decorative arts. Um, but for instance, so it was an immersive experience in that I said we absolutely have to have music in the show because it's absolutely essential to the Disney experience and, and indeed to a lot of the decorative arts that were on display because they would have been part of a performance at a banquet uh, where music would have been played when you would have eaten off the, the Sevres of porcelain. Um, and then the thing is that I think you really have to, as an individual curator, follow your gut feeling as to how far you can go. Uh, depending on the subject matter. So for instance, I insisted that we should have one or two objects on rotating platforms uh, because it was about the animation of decorative arts. So there was one, this really famous um, uh, uh, gilt bronze candlestick for which you, your museum has the original drawings or the, 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 the engravings. And I really want to show how Missonnier was carrying your eye across that complicated surface, a kind of abstract sculpture. And um, I absolutely loved it. I would do it time and again. There was one reviewer who thought, who said, you know, he never saw a museum mistreat its collection in such a horrid way. I mean, he was absolutely offended by it. And indeed, and I can't remember whether it was the same review or someone else also said that, um, because we did the same thing with two uh, dancing porcelain figures. And he said that um, it reminded him of, um, Barbie ballerina. And I thought to myself, well, where do you think Barbie ballerina comes from? You know, she's the great, great, great granddaughter of 18th century automata that started dancing, you know, animation of decorative arts. Anyway, I think, um, I think depending on the subject matter, you just have to sort of test out how far you can go and how far you want to go before it becomes the Van Gogh experience where you step into 
a, a pure animation that there's no work of art, because ultimately all you want to do is always raise the attention to the original object. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, and, and these immersive experiences, though, have had a positive effect for museums, and that there have been a clutch of people that have gone to them that then want to go to MoMA and see the original painting, or the Mad, or Brooklyn or a Cooper Hewn, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, it, it, does, it does spark an interest in some people who might not have been interested before. Yes. And also people felt like some, some versions of the Van Gogh experience, you know, they felt like they actually were learning his life story, you know? Uh, there's, there's so many, uh, uh, you know, little anecdotes you hear about an artist, but then sometimes you don't know, re really know what happened. So not to say that those exhibitions are, are being so meticulous about their research, but, <laughs> but it's but giving you a window. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but also movement actually is quite an interesting thing, because obviously the immersive experience animate their pictures. Uh, you spin your plates as it were, uh, and then you have the paradox of fashion, which is meant to move yes. and, and rarely can. So there's this conflict in a museum gallery around movement, and how do you deal with that without offending reviewers who don't want to see anything moving at all? Mm -hmm. Well, there's, you know, the, 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 the thing if you're working with great costume design, great couture design, is that they allow themselves to have greater inspection uh, than, say, if you were just doing an exhibition about theater costumes, for example. Theater costumes are often designed or produced to look a particular way on stage under a particular kind of lighting. And so, for example, if you were making a fur coat to be seen on stage, typically you would take the fur and you would have it turned up so that the light goes into it and then it looks fuller versus if you were making a fur coat for everyday wear, not, not, I'm not advocating or dis uh, advocating <laughs> fur, but as, as an example, you would have the pelt going down. So theater costumes are more challenging for, for uh, a museum display. So, you know, but if you have the level of like Bowie was working with Kansai Yamamoto, he was working with Alexander McQueen, you know, meticulous uh, cost fashion designers, tailors, their work can be looked that way. But then you have the question about, well, they wore that in a performance and it was so dynamic and how are we gonna get the, the liveliness through? You know, how do you bring in the fact that you know, Christy Turlington wore this dress and oh my God, she did this amazing turn. And you know, those things are often documented in video. They're often documented in video just from one angle and typically from the front. And models don't always turn, you know? <laughs> and fashion is designed to be seen in the round in the same way decorative art subjects are. Um, you know, if you can put them all on rotating pedestal, it would, it would add a lot, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, and uh -huh. if there's enough space for you to move around them, like you do yes. ideally around sculpture. I mean, I think just as a footnote in terms of movement, because I, I agree, you know, there are some things that are supposed to be seen in movement, and just as a footnote with regards to the crown jewels, which are in the Tower of London, and which, of course, several of which were brought out last week, um, one thing that never translates on, on television is the imperial state crown, is this amazing object that is the, the highest concentration of diamonds probably in the world. And what you don't see, and this is the whole reason why you know, people are so obsessed with diamonds, is that they, they sparkle. And it's when you see it in motion, it's just like fireworks. Um, and I, I, I don't know whether it's still the case, but in the tower, I remember when I visited the tower for the first time, is that the, there were conveyor belts to the left and right of, they, they were all, uh, all the crown jewels were displayed in a long case row. And so you, you, you stood on a conveyor belt and basically drove past the crown jewels and therefore they were, because you were in motion, they were in motion. And so you got that sense of, of the sparkle of the, of the diamond. So that worked really well. Doesn't necessarily translate into full gowns, but um, 
anyway, that was one way of solving that problem. No, I think that's that's the the thing is that you know, and if you have a beautiful uh, Dior gown and it's fully embellished with sequins, you know, how do you get that sparkle to happen again? You know, without the model. So we're always investigating things, either like rotating or having the lights programmed so that they change. Or you know, I have. Uh, we, I worked on a Gautier show where we actually did have some of the clothes on conveyor belts and rotating. Uh, and with Bowie, going back to Bowie, at the end we had a concert room. So you could actually see him performing in the costumes. Uh, and of course he was a great performer, but then you have the issue that not every musician is a performer, right? You know, some musicians just they sit with their guitar and you listen to them sing. And you know, if you were if you were doing, I'm just thinking, if you were doing Johnny Cash, you know, for example, and you're doing great black suits, you know, he There would be a certain power to it. Yeah, right, exactly. But. Can I just if I may just one add one thing in terms of motion, I think one one element that obviously in, in the in the Disney exhibition we had a lot of animation and so you obviously want to be conscious of that, and we're always automatically drawn more to the moving image than to the to the yes. object that stands still, which is why I made a point in all of the galleries to always have the moving image first, so that you have the screen with an animation first, and then all the other objects, because I thought otherwise, if it's at the end of the gallery, people are so drawn to it that they'll bypass everything, and so sort of skip the static, and then yeah. go to the screen, so I wanted the visitor to have their fix first. Okay, let's look at the moving image. Okay, we've seen that. And then they could focus on the other things. The Whether that worked, I don't know. Well, the Lagerfeld exhibition yeah. throws that up in quite an interesting way. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. seen it mm -hmm. yet. Yeah. But in the first, so you have the first room with him doing a sketch, which is all very vivid and exciting. Then you go to the next room where there are actual the proper dresses. And there are four interviews with his premier, the people who made the dresses projected above them and every single member of the public stands yeah. watching the video. The dresses could be chopped liver, which is a really interesting way of beginning an exhibition. Um, it's hard, you know, and when you do enter that gallery, I don't know if you've seen Lagerfeld yet, but you should go, uh, is that you walk in and, oh, by the way, and it's on a queue, so go early, because you have to get on a virtual queue yeah. to get into this exhibit. <laughs> That's correct. Really. Uh, but you walk into the gallery and there is a QR code that'll point you to watch those videos by yourself when you have more time. But people are just, you know, they're drawn to the image. And below the image, you know, there's this extraordinary, you know, Chanel gown and which, you know, on its own just could have held the whole room, you know. So um, it is. This, this is a big issue yeah. about the moving image versus the static image. Yeah, no, I think you have to yeah, think very carefully about yeah. that. But yes. this might be an interesting point then to move on to the digital, where in the digital realm, there are things move a lot. You can use whatever dimensions you like, mm -hmm. but the display of them and actually what the thing is, right. is very contentious. So how, as somebody who is heading up this new department at Cooper oh, well, Hewitt. I mean, it depends upon what you're talking about with the digital. The digital is so incredibly broad um, within traditional kind of art museum context and collecting. You know, there's time-based media art, which is, um, you know, whether it's, it's video work or sound work, and perhaps it is, um, contingent upon a cathode ray tube television set or some such, you know, so something like that might be an example of it. However, the digital can also be a website. It could be the emoji on our phone. It could be an application. It could be um, some type of video work. So it really, it really depends upon what specifically it is. And I always come back to uh, the statement that you know, it just it it depends upon the intention, the curatorial intention for what it is and what you want your audiences to glean from it. Um, Right now, with a lot of the work that I'm collecting, you know, a perfect example is uh, is a website that I had collected um, 
And I mean, how in God's name do you collect a website? Well, we did it in the most complicated way, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and the website itself, it's called Watercolor Map Tiles, um, and it takes all uh, open street map data uh, and puts a watercolor filter over top of it. So it's actually, it's completely beautiful uh, and very much subverts the notion of what a map itself is. It's not necessarily around the function and getting yourself from point A to point B, but it actually is just looking at the beauty itself um, of uh, geography and, and topography. Uh, so with that particular uh, with that particular piece, we ended up um, bringing in all of the code and all of the backend assets, and then um, we now host it live on Smithsonian's. Uh, own domain uh, and on our server. So in a, in a sense, we've sort of like forked it off and now there are like two versions of this thing, but we've made it available um, to anyone, you know, to go in and continue to use this. And so at some point, the original designer is going to take down the original watercolor map tiles and the Smithsonian's version will continue to live on, which is also just a fascinating case study um, to really think about then, you know, what, you know, how does, how does the use value change? You know, what will that look like in 50 years, 100 years from now? Um, you know, but really allowing it to live on the web, which is kind of its native environment. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's, it's, it's a challenge, I think, with digital work sometimes, bringing it into a gallery experience. Yes. Um, because oftentimes we are experiencing digital technology, whether it's on our phone or on our computer at home or whatnot. And so how do you, how do you bring that into a museum and into a gallery faithfully, um, yes. which is challenging. Yeah, and also, I guess there are also problems around posterity, aren't there? And we're sort of seeing that now with the most cutting edge video work from the 60s and the 70s, which is using pretty much redundant technology and website technology becomes redundant as well. So mm -hmm. if it's just existing online, how do you future-proof that for yeah. audiences. Well, I mean, that's that gets into, you know, huge conversation um, or conservation uh, uh, conversations and whatnot of, you know, right now I'm working with some absolutely fantastic conservators um, who, you know, we're really looking at how in the world do we <laughs> try to maintain these things in perpetuity? And I think the one thing which is, um, which is really unique and exciting uh, is that it's actually really much changing the, the dialogue and moving away from a place of, of, you know, with traditional objects, you're always trying to maintain a level of stasis, keep them in very secure environments, you know, very regulated and controlled climates uh, and whatnot so that you're preventing any type of change to happen to it. However, with, um, with digital work, you actually have to embrace the change because um, it really then is, is almost, kind of this, this um, gardening method of taking care of it because of the fact that so many of, um, of these types of, of works, uh, as we call them, are, are not just um, standalone works. I mean, they're contingent upon other types of software or operating systems or hardware or networks or something. And so we constantly have to be um, exploring them and, and ensuring that, um, that they are uh, that they're continuing to live, yes. <laughs> if you will. I mean, there's very much a biological metaphor with it. Which raises something else actually about the non-digital land, yeah. which which we discussed earlier about. Um, uh, and Wolf, I'm afraid I'm going to directly bring you into this because, as you said when you joined the Met, you were overseeing the refurbishment of the British galleries. And there's something about the maintenance of a, let's say, semi-organic organism like a digital website yeah. where you're, you're perpetually course correcting yeah. because you're always updating it. With buildings and permanent displays and exhibitions for as long as they last, it's fixed. It's a fixed version of how you're telling that story. So uh, as we come near an end of this conversation for time reasons rather than subject matter reasons, um, how does everybody think that what they're doing is the ultimate version of it? Or how open to reinterpretation are we all? May I jump in there? Please do. I mean, I think one thing that we, it, it might be helpful to remind all of ourselves of is that none of us are doing any rocket science, right? So what we're doing as curators is basically what curators have been doing for the last 250 years, which is trying to shed light on objects or stories they deem important. Um, and so, for instance, with the British Galleries, which I inherited when I arrived at the Met, 
I think uh, some of my colleagues slightly fell into the trap in promoting the new galleries, which are wonderful, and I can't take any credit for them, but I think they are, because I just inherited them, I was just the midwife, but they are, they're wonderful galleries, um, and you can promote them as wonderful without being rude about the, the previous iteration of the galleries, and I think sometimes one falls into the trap and said, what were they doing 30 years ago, and you know this, but, but they were very much of their time and were highly celebrated at their time when they opened, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, who knows how people are going to look back at our work in 30 years, um, which I'm sure you know, will be very easily datable, both in terms of design as well as conception and, and narrative. Um, and I think that's fine, that we can just embrace that, that we shouldn't, we shouldn't right now worry how people are going to judge us in 30 years, but we should also be quite gentle about the work of our predecessors because our work builds, builds on their, their achievements, et cetera. Um, so I, th I think, but I, I, I don't know, I don't know about the two of you, but I observe that quite a lot, people being, oh, what were they doing back then? I said, well, wait a minute, they were working within the parameters that um, mm. they were given. Yeah. No, it's absolutely true. And sometimes you go to a museum, uh, not necessarily in New York, where they've had an, a, perma a permanent installation up for 30, 40, 50 years, and you walk into it and you feel like you're you know, walking into an attic or something, you know? <laughs> and it can be quite uh, extraordinary to walk in and you learn so much uh, just from seeing it in real life versus photograph in a book or a, a website. So, you know, today when people say permanent exhibition, you know, or in a, in a meeting, and I always say, well, how long is permanent? Yeah. You know, because it's, it's not true that it's permanent. It's all temporary. And it has to change because, you know, today uh, we, we have whole new ways of thinking in different contexts. At Brooklyn, you know, during the COVID era, you know, we had to start thinking, rethinking about how we were installing the American galleries because the conversations about America have changed so much today. So you can't just ha walk in and just have George Washington without a context. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, I would, you know, to piggyback on all of that, and I think particularly because of the work that I'm doing now with um, collecting file and code base work for the museum, I feel like we're, we're always evolving. And I, we're always learning, like I'm always learning so much each and every time um, we're collecting any piece of, of digital work. Um, but I'm also always learning from my colleagues, <laughs> from, um, from the way in which other exhibitions and other work is presented. Um, I know one thing I had brought up to you is like the, the Astor Gates exhibition. I don't know oh, if either yeah. of you saw it. Mm -hmm. And there was that one gallery that was just like a field of objects with no pedestals and you could walk amongst the object. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was wild. I absolutely loved it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, God, I want to do that at some, I mean, you know, so it's just, I think that it's, it's just, you know, it's a constant conversation and it's something that we are constantly learning. And mm -hmm. um, I think the one thing as curators is um, we can never be so steadfast in our ways that, you know, yes. the way in which we're doing something is like, this yeah. is this is the way it's done. No, I mean, it's it's Absolutely. an iterative process. Constantly. But it's very easy to fall into that. It's true. And say, oh, yeah. well, we've never done things like that or we haven't done it. So, I mean, I've, I've had that with a Disney exhibition all the time. I was like, no, no, we've never done this. But well, we've also never done a Disney exhibition. So. So now that we've all consoled ourselves that we're perpetually right about never being right in permanence, I think that's probably a good moment to draw this conversation to an end. I'd like to thank my speakers for joining me, Andrea, Wolf, and Matthew. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>